As we grow and mature in life, there are things that we face. As babies, we grow from bottles to solid food. As a child, you go through different grades in school. Teens face things like learning to drive and high school and all of that. Adults face things like higher education, employment, and family. But this, the same thing can be said for our spiritual lives. You know, we grow and we face many things in our Christian walk. Some things we succeed in and others we fail in. But one thing that I feel like we all face from one point in time to another is condemnation. If you've ever seen the movie or read the book on Pilgrim's Progress, you'll notice that he kept thinking back to where he messed up. You know, as he was on this journey of life, he kept looking back and he kept being reminded of all the times that he failed, all the times that he messed up. But, you know, in Romans 8, 1 and 2, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. And so I want to take a minute to, to just kind of talk about what is condemnation. First of all, condemnation is not conviction. You know, a lot of times we can kind of get the two mixed up. So I have a list here, and this is actually something that I borrowed from Mars Hill Church, but it, it describes the differences between condemnation and conviction. Conviction is from God. Condemnation is from Satan. Conviction leads to life. Condemnation leads to despair. Conviction ends in joy. Condemnation ends in sorrow. Conviction makes us want to change. Condemnation makes us believe that we can't. Conviction leads to a new identity in Christ. Condemnation leads to an old identity in sin. Conviction brings specific awareness of a sin. Condemnation brings vague uncertainty about sin. Conviction looks to Jesus. Condemnation looks to self. Conviction is a blessing, and condemnation is a burden. And you see, a lot of times, the, the Holy Spirit will convict us when we're, when we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing. But a lot of times... Even after we've moved past that, even after we're, we're done with that, condemnation comes in and it still, it puts guilt on us. So today I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about what causes condemnation and what does God say about condemnation and then finally how can we overcome condemnation. So first of all, what causes condemnation? Well, the obvious answer to, this, to that is that sin causes condemnation. In Hebrews 12.1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Now, there's something I want you to notice about this verse. You notice that it says the sin that so easily trips us up. And so what is the sin that so easily trips us up? You know, the sin is the specific sin that we deal with in our own personal life. Maybe it's greed, maybe it's lust, maybe it's adultery. You know, no matter what it is, it's what you're dealing with. Because the devil isn't going to bring temptation of every sin on every person. Because we all struggle with different areas in our lives. And so, the thing is that it's the sin. It's that specific thing that we deal with that causes us to be condemned. Another thing that can cause us to be condemned is when we compare ourselves to other people. And you know, I've, I've kind of gotten past that point in my life of comparing myself to other people. But I used to deal with it quite a bit when I was younger. 
I remember the first time that my pastor had asked me to uh, to speak. You know, I I automatically had in my head that I needed to be like him, and I I. I automatically had in my head that, you know, if I don't do things the way that he does them, then I'm failing. But, you know, as I, as I begin to get out and speak more and, and find my own identity in speaking in that, God began to show me, you know, you're not him, you're not anyone but yourself. So don't compare yourself to other people. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, But the Lord said to him, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And the, the context of this verse is God had sent Samuel to go anoint a king. And so Samuel went to the house of Jesse. And he was he was going through his sons he was looking for the king that he was to anoint and he saw all of these strong and and powerful men and he thought to himself surely these are the ones that god wants but god told him look i don't see people the same way that you see people i see people differently and so don't judge them the way that by their appearance or by their height or anything because i don't see them that way i see the heart and so we got to realize that when condemnation comes on us, when we start thinking that other people are better than us, then we got to get in the mindset that God doesn't judge the same way that we do. The third thing is that we often try to earn God's love. And you know, I, I did this a lot when I was little. And... Um, I felt like, even though I knew that I was saved and it was by faith and it was by His grace, I still felt like I needed to be so good or maybe I could lose that or maybe I would, you know, God would uh, punish me or that. And the thing is, when I got older, I realized that it's not a matter of I got to be good so that God will love me. Because God loves us no matter what. It's a matter of I want to be good and I want to do what pleases Him because of the price that He paid for me. In Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it says, God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. So none of us can boast about it. So we have to realize that we're not trying to earn God's love. We're not trying to, you know, make him proud of us. Does it make him proud of us when we do these things that please him? Yes. But he's not going to stop loving us if we mess up. He knows that we're going to mess up. You know, when, when condemnation gets into our lives, it can have devastating effects. One of the things is we focus so much on it that we lose track of what's really important. You know, we're fe we feel like we're not able to really carry out what God has planned for us because we're unworthy. And that unworthiness and that shame and that guilt just continues to, to manifest in us and therefore, we, we can't put our focus on Him and what He has prepared for us. And it also causes us to put a separation between us and God. Because we see ourselves as dirty, and we see ourselves as messed up, and we see ourselves as broken. And we think, how can God want to have to do with me? How can God love me when I'm such a mess? And so what does God say about our lives and about condemnation in our lives. First of all, we need to realize this, that the wrong that we do is not a surprise to God. He knows us more than we could ever know ourselves. In Psalms 139, 1-4, it says, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. 
You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say, before I say it. And so we got to realize that the things that we do are not a surprise to him. He knew and he, he created us anyway. You know, I, I love the verse that says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And you know, people think a lot of times that once you get saved, you just automatically stop sinning. You just live a perfect life, you know, or else maybe you're fake or something. But the thing is that as we, as we submit ourselves to Christ, He starts to change us. And you know, things that I dealt with at a younger age, I don't really deal with much anymore. But there's new things that I deal with. You know, as you grow and as you change in, in your maturity and your, your walk with Christ, He helps you get past things. But we're never going to reach that place of perfection until we're with Him, until we're in heaven. And so, we have to realize that He knows us. He knows that we're going to continually mess up. He also knows how weak we are. But the thing is that he doesn't he doesn't judge us because of that. He doesn't you know punish us because of that. In Psalms 103 8 and through 14 it says, "The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love." He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heaven above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers that we are only dust. And you know, the thing of it is, we deserve punishment for our sin. You know, we deserve hell. We all do. But he's so loving and he's so kind that he continually shows us mercy. You know, his word says that every day... His mercies are new. In Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. You know, a lot of times we, we get under condemnation and we think, Well, you know, I'm not deserving of this. Well, we're not. We're not deserving of His mercy, but... He, that doesn't stop him from showing us his mercy. In John 3.17 it says, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. You know, oftentimes we, we get in the thought of, you know, well, maybe God sends people to hell because they're bad or that. It's not like that. He provided a way out. And he's provided a way out of condemnation. I want to read right quick the story of, of the woman that was caught in adultery. It's found in John 8, 1 through 11. It says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. 
When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. And see, what we got to realize is that just as Jesus showed mercy to the woman caught in adultery, he shows mercy to us. When, when we fall, he picks us up and he puts us back on our feet. And instead of condemnation, he shows us compassion. So how do we get free from condemnation? How do we overcome it? First of all is that we have to admit our failures. 1 John 1, 8-10 says that if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that His word has no place in our hearts. So the thing is that we don't, go around pretending that we're we haven't sinned but instead we ask God to forgive us and we we have a trust and a faith that he will you know it it doesn't do any good to pretend that we don't have faults because when we pretend that we don't have faults, when we pretend that everything is alright, then we lose our dependence on Him. And so what we have to do instead is admit that we've messed up. And we have to ask Him to do the work that needs to be done in our lives. You know, in Ephesians it talks about how God sees us as his masterpiece and how he how much he loves us and how he's he's doing this work in us but we have to allow him to do the work we can't do the work on our own you know i don't know how many times i tried with with struggles in that i tried to do it on my own i tried to fix the problems on my own but we can't we have to depend on him the last thing is that we have to allow him to do the work. We can't try to, to, to fix this on our own. We can't try to have a plan B or anything. We have to allow him. And the thing is, it's going to hurt sometimes. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of an uh, excerpt from the C.S. Lewis book, The Great Divorce. It talked about this guy who, or this ghost that, that went to heaven. And he had this lizard on his shoulder. And this lizard all the time would torment him. And, and would say things to him that would just aggravate him. And so when he was in heaven, he, an angel came up to him. And it asked him, it says, do you want me to get rid of that? And he says, yes, I want you to get rid of that. And he says, okay, I'll get rid of that. But first of all, I got to tell you, it's going to hurt. And the ghost was like, "No, then I I don't want to be any pain. I don't want I don't want you to get rid of it if it's gonna hurt." And so he says, "Okay, I won't get rid of it." And so then he he went on, and and the lizard kept tormenting him. So the angel came to him, and he says, "Do you want me to get rid of that?" And he says, "Yes, I want you to get rid of that." And he says, "Okay, but it's gonna kill it, and it's going to hurt you." <clears throat> and he says, "Well, I don't want you to I don't want you to do that." And so on and on it went on like this. And finally, finally the ghost had had enough. And he says, "Okay, I I want you to do it. I want you to kill it." And the angel says, "Okay, but it's going to hurt." And he says, "Okay, but I want you to do it." And so what we have to do is we have to get to that point where we're ready to let this stuff go. And, you know, and God is here and he's ready and he says, you know what, it might hurt. You know, sometimes we like the sin that we're trapped in. Sometimes we like 
you know, the feelings in that that we have, even if they're wrong. And God says, I can get rid of that for you. And we have to come to that point where we say, okay, God, I'm ready, get rid of it. And we have to realize that, that nothing we do in our Christian walk is done by our own power. The life of a Christian is lived by relying on God to make up the difference where we fall short. And so each day our prayer should be, Lord, make me more like you and make me less like me. You know, I, I remember when I, I first started praying this. And I remember hearing, it was, it was after hearing John Bevere talk about when he first started praying this. And he, he told God, he said, Lord, make me more like you. Get rid of all the junk that's in me. And that he noticed that as, as the day started to go on, that, that all this nastiness and all this anger and hatred and everything started coming out of him. And he, he was like, God, what's the deal? I, I asked you to make me more like you. <coughs> and God told him, he said, it's a process. You know, and I have to get this stuff out of you. And we may not always like what we see. We may not always like the attitudes that we see coming out of us, but, but sometimes it has to come out of us. And so in closing, we have to remember this. We're not made to walk in condemnation. We're made to walk in the freedom that comes from God. And He will continually work those things out of us and help us to get free from that condemnation.